Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, Truth Seekers, and Truth Crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funkin' Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership keyboardist, producer, and composer, Wes Boatman. During the 1980s, he recorded, collaborated, and performed with some of Funk's top artists, including Bootsy Collins, George Clinton, Junie Morrison, Midnight Star, Dayton, Microwave, or Microwave, uh, Roger Troutman, Heatwave, Sun, Slave, Lakeside, The Daz Band, Pieces of a Dream, and The Ohio Players. He then went on to become an Emmy-winning television music composer. His recent credits include Bootsy's 2020 album, The Power of the One. Wes, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm great, thank you, and I appreciate you having me here. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. So glad you could come on. And uh, where are you today? Uh, I'm in northern Kentucky, uh, and, and I although I've got a virtual background here, uh, uh, that's actually uh, the view out my back door. So <laughs> that so your virtual view is your actual? Yes. Well, I think you're the first person I've. Uh, done this with it's had a backdrop that they is actually where they are it's kind of fun yeah well uh, the only difference is is uh, i've raised it up a little bit and cropped the horse fence out uh from the bottom of the picture but that's uh where we are here in northern kentucky wow it looks like beautiful countryside you know that's one of the states i've still not been to yet really well you need to come visit sometime i hear the uh pastures are gorgeous yes that's wonderful yeah, a good place to just drive through, it sounds like, yeah, for sure. It yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've listened to you for uh, many years with your great keyboard embellishments to so many songs that I hold near and dear, so it's great to have you on, and I'm sure the viewers feel the same. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Wes, you're from Cincinnati, I understand, and right. um, you picked up music early. Can you tell us about coming up in the environment that you, you know, were brought up in and, and how music became so central to your life? Sure. Um, originally, um, you know, when you're a child and you watch your parents do various things, you, you accept it for what it is and not question the reality. And what I mean by that is my mom could play piano 
and she could always play piano very, very well. And I didn't realize she couldn't read music and didn't know notes and everything she did was completely by ear. And when I was in second grade, I started taking piano lessons. And it was at that point that I had the little chart, you know, that goes in front of the keys with the notes. And when I was learning what the notes were was when she was learning what the notes were as well. And she had a whole book of songs and uh, she would have the song um, title and then a, a, a notation, you know, F or C or so, you know, and, and that wasn't the key that it was in, but that was the note that she started on and she could play really, really well. I mean, totally wear it out. And I, very few people i occasionally hear people that play with her style it was a uh, oftentimes uh rolling right hand accompaniment and melody in the left hand and then s switching up and and very uh and it wasn't until i was much much older that i realized she had perfect pitch uh but the whole time i was growing up it was mommy i want to play like you well i would ask her how did you learn to play? And she would say, well, uh, when I was little, I would sit at a windowsill and I would pretend I was playing on the windowsill. And when I could sit down at the piano, I could play. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, is this Oz? Is this Never Neverland? Where is this, where, where is this magic windowsill that I could find to be able to play like you? Um, so then uh, the school music program where I went to school was, was a very, very good music program they still had music programs you know you know i went to high school right after lee surrendered to grant so it was you know back in the day and i started trumpet in the fourth grade and french horn in the seventh grade and cello in ninth grade and then by default tuba in the grade and um it was very interesting because uh a tuba of all things is such a weird instrument, but by my senior year of high school, I was practicing my horn about four hours a day, and I was going to be a tuba major at CCM at the Conservatory of Music at UC. And at the very last minute, I thought, who the heck wants to be a tuba major? So then I thought about that for about a 30, you know, it takes longer for me to explain it than it took me for, to, to do the decision. And I went, well, Jim Morrison from the Doors had a master's in film from UCLA, so I'll major in film. So I went to CCM and was a broadcast um, television and film major. And one day standing in line to register, I realized that I was in CCM, so I didn't have to petition or beg or plead or whine or cry to take any of the music classes so i started taking composition and orchestration and music theory and all kinds of wonderful things in addition to my tv and film and ended up uh, uh minoring in electronic music uh, which was you know brand you know new and innovative at the time and uh, learned a lot both from dr paul palumbo and his grad assistant david mcclanahan as well as my uh, composition professor scott houston and uh going back to high school uh i don't know uh, i credit my orchestra director dale smith swisher for you know one day he came to me and said i see you plunking around on the piano all the time why don't you write something for the spring concert and i said oh well i couldn't do that that's really he goes no sure you can i hear what you're doing go ahead and write something and i said well what about you know, all the instruments, they're all in, in different keys and everything. And, and uh, uh, he said, oh, the transpositions, that, that's not hard. If you have any questions, just ask. So I embarked on writing a couple pieces for my senior year for our orchestra to play at the spring concert and did so. And, and it was all under the premise of the, direct, the or orchestra director saying, oh, it's not hard. You can do it. Similarly, when I started playing cello a few years before, I was helping him carry some instruments from the junior high to the high school and uh, had a couple violins under one arm and a cello in the other. And I said, hey, are these things hard to play? And he goes, no, you want to learn? And I said, well, sure, why not? So, you know, in, in the spirit of sure, why not? That's how many things uh, actually happen. So like most kids in high school, 
uh, had a very full schedule because I played football. I wrestled. I was on the track team. I was in, played different instruments in the, the band and the orchestra and was in the chorus and vocal groups as well. But music was always my first love. And uh, I remember, you know, you start out as kids, you know, with, with your neighbors and kids in the neighborhood with, with your guitars and your trying to do various things. And I was just telling somebody the other day, I remember the story of us having an old M&E chord organ and going to the music store and getting a series of $2.95 acoustic guitar pickups and taping them inside the, the M&E organ. And when we got it in and plugged through an amp, we could barely hear the note, but we could hear the roar of the bellows of this M&E chord organ, you know, drowning out any of the notes. So. You know, as kids, you try whatever you can to do whatever. And then I graduated to my first red Farfisa Combo Compact and my Fender Bandmaster Two Bottoms. And that was it, you know. Uh, Light My Fire made the big impact when I was in high school. So, you know, me and my Combo Compact and the Doors um, embarked on wanting to play music. And... Uh, it changed when I got into college and the bands became more serious. Uh, I think I got my first Moog synthesizer in 1970. So that was, you know, pretty far back. And wow. uh, I loved, I love synthesis, not necessarily for the sake of orchestral instrument replacement, but for the sake of being new and creative and innovative with my sounds. And uh uh, in addition to taking electronic music from Dr. Paul Palumbo, I took private. So this is, I took privately private lessons weekly from our grad assistant on the principles of synthesis, and we would basically do, you know, uh, dissecting sounds, the whole construction, additive, subtractive synthesis, and everything. So my love for synthesizers uh, was early, early on. And when my classmates and colleagues in school was, a, you know, became aware that I had a Moog, they would always call me and go, hey, man, I'm working on this project. Would you come do some sound effects? And so I'd bring my Moog in and whatever somebody asked me to do, uh, I would do my best to accommodate what they were looking for. And at that point, you know, while I was still in college, I learned that I really, really loved the recording process. So that's, you know, sort of you know, what took me to, uh, to where it, it took me. And uh, uh, it sounds like you were, it sounds like you're a bit of like the music man, you know, I'm thinking of uh, with all those different instruments and just trying whatever. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, why not? You only go around once. So, Hey, you know, uh, you, you do. And uh, you know, that took me in the direction, which in an odd manner of speaking led me to the funk. Um, and if you'd like, I could keep going and talk about. Well, let, uh, let me just interject, if I may, Wes. Um, so you mentioned the Doors, uh, Ray Manzarek. Um, who were a few other, you know, big influences for you early on, um, keyboard wise or arranging wise, and that sort of thing? Uh, oh my gosh. Well. Mike Bloomfield, Al Cooper, that was, you know, uh, somebody in a, in a brief band I was in said, I wish you'd quit playing all that door stuff and let me give you something else. And he gave me, you know, Al Cooper. But then really the most impactful and what led me to how I ended up in the funk were the bands that I played in in the early to middle 70s. We did a lot of uh, yes, Genesis, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, uh, PF and M, uh, you know, things of that nature. So uh, I traded my Farfisa for a Hammond uh, M100, and then the M100 was traded up to a Hammond B3. And then I had my B3 and my Moog, and then a set of Vibes. And then, you know, through that transition, then one Moog begat two, and then an ARP 2600, and then an ARP string ensemble, and then an Elka Rhapsody. And then um, when it was just my B3, I had a set of vibraphones, and it was my B3 and Vibes, and then it became my B3 and Vibes and Moog. 
And then as I progressed through my various rock bands, um, you know, the whole keyboard setup with the B3 and an RMI and a pair of Moogs and an ARP and an ARP string machine and I don't know what all, but everything at the era. Uh, up until including mid to end set, I don't really remember the years of all this. And for that, I'm sorry, but, you know, uh, somebody that's more of a historian than me can go back and see. But um, the latest, greatest innovation at that point was the Prophet 5. And I had a serial number 31 Prophet 5. And my grad assistant that I studied with in college, he and a colleague had a, a music store called the Cincinnati Electronic Music Store. And they basically had one of everything. And I got to tell you, it was almost like the store was put in Cincinnati for the benefit of me, because they would let me walk in and take anything in the inventory back to the studio to record with. So I had my access, you know, access to everything as it came my my profit 31 was going to be his and it had an interesting modification um, in that um, it had a trigger and control voltage input as well as the trigger and control voltage out output and of course you know what i'm talking about voltage and triggers and voltage and gates we're talking way 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 pre-midi and it enabled me and uh uh, Doug Smith, who was the other uh, participant of the electronic music store, we would get together and pile up our synths and do a Friday night or Saturday night jam at the art center in a 360 degree projection space where we would just sit and jam with our gear. And I would be able to, to run one pair, of, one voice out of my profit to control his and his vice of Versa, and we would sit and have interactive jams with our synths and sequencers. And of course, at that point, it was all manual, it was all modular. And then I guess beyond that, the next was probably my Oberheim and my Oberheim expander there and all the things. And, and what happened was uh, a band I was in in Cincinnati, uh, the first band I was in that was labeled was about 1975 or 1976, and it was a band called Haymarket Riot out of Cincinnati, and uh, we had a minimalist record deal on London Records and had released four sides, and they didn't necessarily do anything, but we had been recording albums, you know, and, and things by then, and then uh, Latter 70s, about 78 or 79, I got a call from the owner, Rich Goldman at Fifth Floor Studios. And he said, hey, I got this guy coming in. He's going to record. He's bought a big block of time and he's interested in synthesizers. Well, OK, so, I mean, I was I was the guy for that. There was no doubt. And. He, you know, uh, he arranged an appointment for somebody to come and look for my gear. And that person was Walter Junie Morrison. And Junie drove down from Dayton in a Rolls Royce and parked out front of our studio and came in and looked at my gear and looked at my setup and said, yeah, this will do. Um, can I get you to come and bring your gear? And, and it, it began what was the embryonic phase of synthesizer programming. And what I mean by that- Were, were you familiar with Junie before you met him had, at that point? Had no clue. Understand okay. that, that you've brought a, a very good, understand I grew up, you know, musically to that point doing, yes, Genesis, Emerson, Lake and Palmer and stuff like that. Okay, I did not know Junie, I did not know George, I did not know any of those folks. I knew of the Ohio players because I had a friend that was the lead singer of a Holiday Inn band. And when I'd go hear her band play, they would do fire and whatever the hits were, at, you know, in the middle 70s as far as the players, but I didn't know anybody. So here came Junie and he looked at all my gear and I started going over to fifth floor every day to do sessions with him. And he absolutely scared me to death. And what I mean by that is he would come in, he would put down a little beatbox click track, 
and then he'd go out and put down this reference piano track that was harmonically so complex it would sound to me to my ear like Herbie Hancock or like Chick Corea or like McCoy Tyner it was just you know it it was a very advanced piano vocabulary and then he would put down the drum track and then he would sit on the couch and play the living daylights out of this Fender bass and then we would start to do synthesizer overdubs and um he would cover the complex harmonic layers with little simple one note synth lines, you know, that were that were reminiscent, not at, unlike what he did, uh, you know, with P-Funk, with all those, you know, uh, all of those songs. Uh, but I did not know him. And uh, like I said, he scared me to death. And I went back to the guys in my band watching him do, you know, basically a track a day playing everything and said, wow, if this is what it's like, you know, with people actually making records, then no wonder everybody here in Cincinnati is having a problem because, you know, this was something to behold. So Junie was first. And I would suspect that his reputation of very being very, 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 very particular and reclusive. Uh, he was a musical genius and uh, he became a dear friend over the years. And we worked on many things together. And um, I, you know, I, I miss him the significant because you know, it'd be like every few weeks or at least once a month, I'd just be able to call him and go, hey, Schoon, where are you at? And we'd start laughing because we went through the early programming phases, really pre-MIDI of, uh, let's see, I had a setup at that time that was, I got to think about this for a minute because it was interesting. Uh, Fred Conrad, who was my technician at, at a repair shop called Secret Service, um, at a point, I realized that I needed my gear and I needed it repaired now. So I worked an arrangement with the old owner of the, the shop, Bob Monday, that I paid him a monthly retainer. And the retainer enabled me to bring in whatever I had and they would stop what they were doing and they would fix us now. And every couple months we would settle up or, or let it ride or at the end of the year, make sure we were copacetic. But it it was you know it was a it was a, enough of an amount. I mean you know I'm talking I'm thinking I'm remembering around three or three hundred fifty dollars a month as a as a repair retainer um, that they would bring it in and then I would go in and Fred would fix my gear and one day he would say something to me so interesting as would it be handy for you to have your two mogs tied together so you could play play them both from the same keyboard. And it's like, well, yeah. And I came back a couple of weeks later and he had a, a trunk line that was, you know, Jones plugged from one to the other and a pair of toggle switches. And if I flipped the toggle switch one way, it enabled me to have both face boards of each Moog. In essence, he made me like a six oscillator mini row. OK, and if I flip the toggle switch the other way, then. The faceboard settings on the one would be live and the faceboard settings on the other would be live and I was able to articulate two sounds simultaneously from the same mode controller. And at that point, Oberheim, the OBXA had its own sequencer uh, and again, you know, way pre midi and it had a series of, of trigger you know cv and and trigger control voltage and trigger outputs on the back and then inputs on the back so from my oberheim sequencer i was able to sequence not only the obxa but two moog lines an oberheim expander line and then i had purchased one of the big doctor clicks which you know 1970 1980 uh, $1700 was a big amount of money to be spending on a device that was just a sync box because the Oberheim was like a 48 clock, Roland products were a 24 clock and with my DX7 I had an MSQ Roland sequencer so I'd sequence some parts with it and then uh, the Lindrum was yet a different clock so I would run all these through the Dr. Click 
and be able to uh, do a, a really solid basic track within my gear to the extent that I remember being with Junie someplace or other, we were going to hear somebody somewhere and, and somebody walked up to us and the person looked at me and he goes, oh, I've heard of you. You're the guy that takes four hours to set up and 15 minutes to record. And it's like, oh, I, I hadn't really thought of it as that, but you know, we did all our pre-production for what we were doing and then just came in and set the gear up and, you know, got all the inputs and everything going and pushed the button. But in that early period, uh, major credit goes to really two other people. One, um, learning to play the, I can safely say that I've had the grace of God to be able to have played on same tracks with Junie and, and we would play something and we'd be recording something, you know, and, and, and we'd play a part and we would just bust out laughing at each other, you know, and then he'd play a part and I'd bust out laughing with him and we'd keep going. When I started working with, with Bootsy, what an amazing, talented, and interesting character he is and was back then. I remember who, who, who introduced you to him. I don't recall. I would have to say that the credit for all of these introductions comes to and through Fifth Floor Recording, which would be Rich Goldman, because he was out soliciting business for his studio and had all of these people, you know, coming in. And, and eventually we had a thriving recording market in Cincinnati of all places. Fifth Floor was, was the one to start it all. And then uh, another studio, Counterpart Creative Studios was a second and QCA was a third. And bands were coming in and they were, they were doing bulk time buys. And what I mean by that would be six and seven days a week, 12 hours a day for six months at a time. And uh, in that, uh, everybody would start to call and go, hey, man, I need your Moog. Hey, man, I need your this. Hey, I need your that. And inevitably, what became an issue I would come in my truck, and, and by that point, I had a, a very wonderful guy, Dougie Rhodes, that I called him Mugsley. Mugsley drove my truck for me and would help bring my gear in and set it all up. And inevitably, somebody would say, I need this, but what they really needed was that, and it was still down in the truck. And one day, Keith Harrison from the Daz Band uh, was in, he was still in heat wave at the time. And we were in recording with Johnny and Keith Wilder and they had just gotten back from LA and I'm talking to Keith cause we had become good friends. And it was like, Oh man, how was your experience? Where'd you record? What'd you do? And I said, who did your programming? And he said, Michael Boddicker. And I said, Oh, what'd he have? And he said, Oh, he had three ultimate support racks of, and had one of everything. And I thought, that's really interesting from a marketing strategy um, that made a lot of sense. So I told Mugsley from, from here on out, whenever we come to do a session, just bring everything in. And I hadn't started buying keyboard racks yet. So we would open up the anvil cases and set them up in a, in a V and, and set everything on. So we would start in the control room and work our way out to the hall in the lobby with you know all these keyboards all all plugged in at that point i think i had 15 road cases full of gear and connections and you name it and what have you so, quite a menagerie yeah well you know it was the, that's the way the way it was and um at a point oh the timelines bootsy had a single called body slam and he was working on that album and he did a Budweiser commercial with Body Slam and everybody was coming in and, and then I started doing sessions with him at that point and then one thing sort of led to another and you know, would go out to his house and I'd come back and we'd be recording things and he would sit with an opus, a Moog opus on his knee and he would sit there and he would do these parts and, and I'd watch him do these parts with his finger. And it was like, I'm, I'm standing there thinking, 
what on earth are y'all doing? Because again, I've been trying to play Rick Wakeman and trying to play Keith Emerson and here's this guy. And I suddenly realized from watching this, it wasn't so much about the part, it was how the part made you feel. And the parts that he was playing had the most profoundly wonderful feel and it got to the point where we would record and again he and I would laugh like crazy too and and I, if I'd be playing a part and he wanted to give it a, a, a you know he would just reach out and grab my hands and pull them off the keyboard you know and we would just laugh hysterically at that and yeah. at a point Rich Goldman said to me well you're here for all these sessions do you just want to be an be the assistant engineer too and it was like well sure so I got paid by the studio for being an assistant engineer and I got paid for the labels for being synthesizer programmer. And what happened was I started, you know, and, and one day Gary Platt, who was one of the main engineers of, you know, Gary Platt, Robin Jenny, Rick Probst, Smitty, Dale Smitty Smith were the main engineers of all these things at that point in time on all these records. And then Platsky looked over at me and goes, you know, but one of these days, one of these bands is going to pick you up. And I hadn't thought about that because there was something interesting about the recording protocols in that you learn to keep your eyes open and your mouth shut. And, and I didn't really, I mean, I don't know what everybody thought I had all these keyboards for, but I really made a point to never even inflict or insert a musical opinion or let anybody know. I mean, I've been programming sessions for well over a year before I let anybody know I even played. And it was like, I, you know, I don't know what they figured I had all these keyboards for if I didn't play, but my business in a session was to make it go smoothly for the artist and the band. And my goal was to always help the band keyboard players or the other band members get what they were looking for, uh, be innovative, be unique, and maintain the integrity of confidentiality of sounds for each and every separate band. Meaning, you know, when I went to Bootsy sessions, I loaded my gear with Bootsy sounds. And when I went to Junie sessions, they were loaded with Junies and no one else had access to, to anyone else's sounds. Um, and I made sure of keeping all of that in strictest confidence because by and large, those were all closed sessions. But I remember the first time when I was I getting- got, I got it. Let me jump in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in in certain spots, Wes. Um, sure, please do. Um, well, that point that you just made, I think is uh, very interesting because, you know, Ohio came up with all these funk bands around the late 70s, early 80s, and- they all still had their own sounds, you know, even right. though they were all doing yeah. funk. And so I think that point that you bring up about sort of safeguarding, you know, those unique sounds was something that was maintained and important and it was evident in the recordings and, you know, music. Well, I thought it was, it just seemed logical at the, at the time. And some of the instruments didn't have, you know, we're talking about starting to record before instruments had memories and before you could write away a series of sounds. And I remember Junie looking at me like crazy because I had a, 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 tab, a, a tablet that was, you know, tear off sheets of the face board of a mini Moog. And whenever we'd get something he was happy with, I'd take my pencil and a sheet and I would, I would mark down all the knob settings of that particular sound and note what it was and note, you know, the date and the song and what it was so that if we wanted to, to go back to that, we could easily go back to it and it would be not sort of the same or not kind of the same, but be exactly the same. And I think that was important to all of those artists. I, I want to mention also about Bootsy, when you came in at that time, he had just tried to come back with the One Giveth album, which ended up being his last Warner Brothers record. They were having a hard time getting it really to hit. And so he came out with Body Slam, which was a non-album single, and that became a hit. Um, and uh, did you play the piano solo on that? No, I didn't. What I did on Body Slam, there's a little in the breakdown, there's this percussion thing that goes, it was like, that's what he had me do. Because see, at that point, uh, they 
they didn't start having me play. What happened was I had been developing a production business for a number of years. So I was getting back to what I said early on about I love doing sessions and I love to record. I just love being in the studio recording. And by golly, if I couldn't be there with my band or with somebody else, I had to go out and invent an excuse to be in the studio. So I developed a business doing uh, corporate music and advertising. So I did a lot of ads and a lot of corporate music. Uh, before I was doing it on my own, there was another studio, Jewel Recording. Uh, Rusty York was the owner of that. And, and Rusty, uh, a wonderful person, Rusty had a hit called Sugar Ree, and he opened the Hollywood Bowl with Sugar Ree in about 1950 or 51. So, you know, R Rusty goes back in that rockabilly era, and he had a studio. And there was a gentleman named Ron McCroby from an agency called Leonard Sive and Associates, and he was doing Kenner Toy Spots. And Rusty called me and said, hey, bring your Moog out. And Ron McCroby was, you know, a very innovative character. And he would say to me, I need a sound that kind of goes, and he would make what he was looking for kind of with his mouth. And I would take my Moog and try and imitate what he just did. And we got along very well at doing that. And I was going, wow, this is a blast. I love doing this. So then, you know, after a period of time, I started soliciting my own ad clients and things of that nature. Um, and so I, you know, ha had a demo reel, but I never played for anybody. And after, you know, um, that whole period of time with Junie, where we're talking bread alone and five, Bread Alone and Five took probably a year, year and a half, but it was at some point during that, I had him in the back room and I played him my demo reel. And he looked at me and he goes, wow, he says, you should be my synth player, not my synth programmer. Um, and of course, you know, we started, I started going up to his place every day for quite a period of time under the premise that we were gonna go out live playing some of those things. But we never did, but you know, just the thought, you know, just going up and being able to play every day with Junie um, was an interesting experience. And then, you know, meeting Bootsy along the way, it was totally different, very interesting, um, way That's out of the... Let me just throw in those Junie albums, very eclectic, but great. I mean, those are really good records. Yeah, I, you know, and, and to be seeing that for the first time, it's like, duh, you know, no wonder I went back to the guys and say, wow, this was just amazing. It scared me to death. Um, but then the band Dayton. Uh, well, like you're, said, you're, you're taught, Wes, you were going to say something about Bootsy. And I wanted to know what your first impression was of Bootsy. When you, you know, what did you think of that guy? Had you, were you familiar with him at all before you first met him? Only in that, okay, uh, I had been at the conservatory and I'd been playing rock bands and doing everything I was doing and became frustrated a year out of college at making 50 bucks a week that was reduced to 25 after the truck broke down and after the PA blew up and after you had to get new horn drivers and after you had to pay the equipment men and after all this stuff. And a friend of mine, the bass player from the band that we were labeled in, had a real estate license. And he said, hey, man, I think you ought to come sell real estate with me. So it was like, uh, you know, you'll find that I'm the type of person that rather than deliberate over something, it's easier to do something and complete it and then decide whether you liked it based on how, you know, you can commiserate over doing something and by the time you make yourself sick commiserating over something you can do it and be done with it and decide whether it was worthwhile so i did sell real estate and um uh, my first full year i was in the president's club at our broker and i did really really well but i was really young i was only 23 years old but you know was you know a, a major producer in in the office but it wasn't exactly right. And that's when I went, um, a friend of mine from Columbus, Bob Lyon was working at Warner Cube Cable up and he, and he goes, and he had me come up and do some things on some shows they were doing. And he and I went on vacation together and uh, we weren't sure where we were gonna go. And I, 
I had a brand new Chrysler Cordoba because I was hot. I was a real estate salesman, man, look at me. And he was doing great at, uh, at cable TV production in Parkersburg, West Virginia by then and had a new Monte Carlo. So I got a, a bag of strawberry swizzles and headed to Bob's and we got there when he got off work and we weren't sure where we were gonna go. So we took a, 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 a licorice stick and swung it on the, the Atlas, you know, there was, and where it touched the waters where we went. So we went to Atlantic City and we got there and we got there late, but decided we wanted to go deep sea fishing. And we went out and we were on this boat and we weren't catching a thing. We referred to it as that's where we caught our $8 sunburn because, you know, uh, it was $8 to go fishing and we're standing there and I'm just looking at the water and realized that wasn't it. And if I took as much time to sell myself in the music business as I was trying to sell somebody's house or, you know, uh, that that was the missing link because you know in the conservatory they taught us many things creatively but they never quite broke it down to the fact that you know you're the product and you need to sell yourself so when i started working with, with bootsy again it would the introduction would have been through fifth floor uh, as was whoever was in the inventory of all those bands you know and at that point it was Junie, it was bootsy it was the ohio players it was Dayton. Uh, within a couple of years, it became Midnight Star. Um, 80 or 81 was my first trip to Detroit with Bootsy uh, to work with George. I don't think, and I didn't know who George was. I said to Muggsley, Muggs, who, who's George Clinton? And he looked at me like an extraterrestrial and says, who's George Clinton? And we went up in his room and he started getting out his records and we're listening to Knee Deep and One Nation Under a Groove and he's playing me Flashlight and all this stuff. And it was like, oh, I get it. So away I went up 75 to Detroit and uh, started working on a couple of albums at that point with George and, and whatever else they were doing. And that was an interesting thing to behold as well, because- uh, Well, did Bootsy seem like this, uh big character to you uh, was he was he funny um did he seem creative um what did you take away all, from him all, all of the above okay so what got me on the real estate tangent was a friend of mine my friend you know said hey bootsy just came into the parchment and oiler office and he was where he would drive a powder blue cadillac with a white top and he had boots up over to his thighs okay so i'm guessing in that environment he came in looking like bootsy the the persona whereas when we recorded uh you know and like at his house he you know jeans and a jean vest and a t-shirt and, and things of that nature um but uh very creative very innovative very um when my wife carolyn first met him it was downtown at, at the studio where i still had partners down there and she was just telling me a couple of months ago she remembered first meeting him um he was down behind some gear doing something and when he raised up she was there and he gave her a big old hug and she went on to say because she was telling someone re recently that he was one of the nicest, oh, he was telling our grandkids that he was one of the nicest men he ever, that she had ever met. So, you know, he, he was always spectacular, you know? I mean, as a person, as a musician, as a human, uh, I can't say enough good things. And we've always had this standing joke about big brother, little brother, because he was born in October and I was born in November the same year and not by too much, but, enough for him to be my big brother and me to be his little brother he, he looks like the same now as he did then i mean i think you know the the glasses and the outfits they help keep him forever uh, youthful yeah it is well he is youthful you know and uh you know i uh what a blessing that you, you know at, at this point um in the early 80s, we did some things. And then by the What's Bootsy Doing album, that was maybe 86, 87 or so. Historians can look that up and correct me. But uh, I think I was able to co-write four songs uh, on that album. 
And then, you know, we kept in touch and did whatever. And then um, he always had this persona where I never did as such. And I remember going to Detroit um, to meet up with him. Uh, he'd given me a programming assignment and it turns out the assignment was for Malcolm McLaren's record and the, and the uh, song was called Waltz Darling. And uh, when I went up to do that, he sent the assistant engineer to the airport to pick me up and he goes, he was telling me the story. He said, well, I told him to go pick up Wes and the guy said, well, what's he look like? And he goes, well, Wes isn't far. Well, he said, Wes is far out, but he doesn't look far out. So uh, that was his description to me. And he also made another comment over the years and I forget when that he was saying to somebody, but I always describe that Wes was good with the go with. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, you knew what sounds would go with something else. So you were always good at the go with because you knew what sounds would go with something else. Uh -huh. and, and, that, and yeah. that's it was kind of you know the nature and um had you ever had you ever encountered uh did you get to see him play bass up close did you ever encounter someone that played like him before <laughs> i'm laughing because yes i was at many recording yes i got to see him and the, the first the first time that he recorded at fifth floor there was this entire wall of bass amps out in the out in the studio i mean i'm not talking one or two i'm talking it went all the way wall to wall that way and it went floor to ceiling that way and then he had his the space base and there were three outputs on the space base and then there were effects but I won't say what they are and what they were, but each each pickup went through its own appropriate effect that all contributed to, you know, what he did and how he did what he did. So, oh yeah, I, I saw him do what he did. Absolutely. So, <laughs> I mean, he had for sure a unique sound and approach, but also just from his, you know, skill as a bass player, you know, how how, how would you judge that or tell people you know, what was his level of uh, musicianship? Well, let, let's go about this backwards. Um, the day that Patty, his wife, sent me the paperwork from the Power of the One album for the songs that I co-wrote, that was just, you know, the publishing and writer's credits and stuff, was the day that it was announced he was number four in the top 50 bass players of all time. So if if we... In other words, I could say any number of things about his level of musicianship, which I always thought was interesting and innovative and absolutely profound. But for him to be number four on the 50 of all time, that's sort of, you know, if that doesn't say it, I don't know what does. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, just uh, always a very distinct and unique approach. Did, Besides did you, being a bigger than life character. Right. Did you also get to meet his brother, uh, Catfish? Oh, and, Catfish, yeah. And what about Bernie Worrell? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because there were there were times, um, uh, I mean, sessions, uh, we, there was a thing that we would describe as the old Catfish vibe, okay? And Catfish had a thing, and it was the old Catfish vibe. And it would be like, well, you know, here comes the track and it would be funky as can be. But then here came the old catfish vibe and that would just put it over the top. So, yeah, I, I knew Cat. I knew Cat well. Yeah, absolutely. And Bernie, I did not know so well, but I knew Bernie and met Bernie and worked with Bernie because whenever, whenever, you know, someone like Bernie would come to town, uh, it would be my gear he was using on whatever we were doing. Well, and, as a, as a, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, as a, as a fellow, you know, keyboardist, um, you know, what did you think of his proficiency and his innovation? <laughs> oh, what? My gosh, his proficiency—he was a genius. I mean, it goes beyond genius. I mean. Um, 
he was classically trained, um, very, very proficient. And he had a knack of whatever part he was playing, it became like if he was playing a string line, it would become the strings. It wasn't just the string line, it would become the strings. You know, it's for whatever part he was doing, it became that part. So it not only was a very musical and very innovative and excellently executed part, but it was uh, uh, the part would take on a life of its own and therefore that life would, you know, a, a tape doesn't have eyes. So it, you know, to make magic come from a tape, it had to be something that had a, a special feel to it. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I feel like he just, you know, it was a canvas and he made colors with it. You know, that's how I felt about his approach. Right. Because I remember, you know, again, not knowing. I knew Bernie was coming and it was like, yeah, I can read a liner credit, but I didn't know what that meant. And I remember asking Junie one day, what, what's Bernie like? And he gave me this face and just, you know, made these hands going all over and said, you know, Bernie was an absolute genius. So, you know, Junie thought Bernie was a musical genius as well. And, and since Junie was one, it would take one to know one. So, you know. Yeah, those two guys together. Wow. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, it, it was so, because, again, understand, we discussed earlier, I didn't know anybody who anybody was until they walked into the studio and I met them. So that was extremely naive on my part. But then conversely, it didn't have any excess baggage with it either. You know, I got to know somebody and meet somebody and work with somebody, uh, helping them do whatever they wanted to do at the time. And... Uh, um, like I said, I didn't let anybody know I played for well over a year. And uh, uh, I remember I was being an assistant engineer on a session and I just set up a B3 and, did, you know, I turned it on and just was making sure it was working and, you know, just hit a few licks and turned around and bumped into to Diamond Williams, the original drummer from the Ohio Players. And he stood there looking at me, grinning like a Cheshire cat. And he goes, so it looks like you've seen one of those before. And I said, well, yeah, a time or two. And then just, he started laughing and I started laughing and I went on about setting up for the session with whatever we were trying to do. But really when I was busted by Diamond, that was the beginning of starting to let others know that I played. Did you uh, gain a nascent appreciation of funk itself? Oh my gosh. At the time I started doing a lot of those sessions, I was the house producer at Counterpart Studios. And Counterpart Studios had the fraternity record label, which had a bunch of artists, uh, Lonnie Mack, two of clubs, uh, and, and I forget you know, who all was on the fraternity roster before Shad O'Shea, the owner, had bought that label. And we did a lot of package recording sessions. Every weekend, somebody would come in and I would do all the charts and parts and call the rhythm section and we would play and then they would do their part and we'd mix it. And, and he would then have a certain number of, of pressings and, and you know he would send them out to radio stations as well as um, uh, cards that went along for I will play the record I won't play the record any number of things you know and would so it was a a manual promotion process when the record industry was still able to do that and um, so you know being there uh, um, and, and then he did a lot of country sessions so I was producing a lot of country sessions while you know, one probably was the most prominent, David Adrian Anderson. We got as far as number 34 in the cash box and billboard top 100. But, you know, uh, I say compare and contrast. You know, you're doing sessions where my hound dog left me and I'm blue and my wife left me with my car. And, you know, on one hand, 
versus George and I'm going to take my shoes off the fries go with that shake and, and, and everything that Junie and Bootsy was doing. It was like, it was so much fun because of course there was a million tracks of synthesizers. Well, duh, you know, it, it didn't get any better than that, you know? Certainly a different feel though, than what you had come up with, you know, getting immersed in, in uh, most of the music on the one, you know? I would have to say that apparently I was able to embrace the style and embrace it quickly. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.